Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 10th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's week in charts is once again brought to you by me, <laughs> and more specifically by Trading Service. This little banner ad I put up a few, oh, a few weeks back. Actually, right around the beginning of the year. It's, it's a year ahead. looks like it's going to be anything but smooth sailing. And so far, that has been the truth. If you go to the trading service page, you'll see that there is a, a way to get started for as little as $47. You can also get under the delayed service. I, I think I'll mention that towards the end. So if you can't afford the service, well, you shouldn't be trading if you can't afford the service. So we'll talk about that in one second. But it's okay to get educated, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that. Anyway, there's a flame screen. Let's just get it out of the way. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So today I want to talk about five simple steps that you can take towards your success as a trader. Now, before we get into that, there's going to be, uh, or there is, some assumptions. First of all, and I know I'm being a little bit Captain Obvious here, but first of all, you have studied a methodology thoroughly, and you know the good, the bad, and more importantly, the ugly. Now, every now and then, people will email me their trading system, and if you're thinking about doing that, um, I'm going to ask that you don't, because I've spent 20-something years working on a methodology, and that's what I believe in, and I'm not going to change overnight but if you do email me a system be prepared for me to just quickly rip it apart and trust me i i rip apart everything i do and i think you have to really be willing to whip things apart as i've said quite a bit a few months ago somebody emailed me a system that made very little bit of money it was accurate but it made a very little bit of money and that's that's typical for systems that are very accurate they make tiny, tiny bits of money, and then all of a sudden they get whacked pretty hard. And this particular system had a 40-something percent drawdown, and I tried to point that out to the individual, and they said, well, by the end of the year, it, was a, it, it made it to the black. Now, this was a system that was a hypothetical mechanical system, so it had 100% benefit of 100% hindsight and let's say that the system would continue to perform like that and the worst drawdown you ever would have would be 50 percent so you'd only lose half of your money now i'm saying that a little bit facetiously but you get the idea could you really sit through that system for the next six to eight months and grind it out after you've already lost half of your money and the answer is probably no so you have to make sure you wrap your head around your methodology not only what could go right but more importantly what could go wrong and if you are working with a methodology then make sure that methodology has the potential for limited losses and unlimited gains because sooner or later you will get whacked in the markets and that's one thing i can guarantee regardless of your methodology and if you're using a so-called ant hill methodology, ant hills like ants, they make little, little, one little crumb at a time. They build this big mound, but unfortunately, one big footprint comes along. The so-called black swan, as Talib would call them, can wipe out everything. So just make sure you've really done your homework with a methodology, or find someone like me who has done the homework for you. And then still do your due diligence. Make sure you fully understand it. Make sure you look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm very frank when it comes to my methodology. I'm probably more frank than anyone out there in the industry. I'd probably make a lot more money if I just spent all my time telling you how great it was instead of spending a considerable amount of time telling you how it's not perfect and how there will be drawdowns and how there will be losses and how that sometimes, and again, i got to stop using this term, but sometimes it will be streaky. Sometimes you will print money for a while, and then you go back to grinding it out. Now, the other big assumption is that you're adequately capitalized and not trading with the rent and grocery money, okay? 
And I see this problem quite often. If you don't have enough money to trade, then you're not going to trade properly. As soon as a stock begins to go against you or any other market that you might be trading, by the way, all this transfers, it doesn't matter. Human, human psychology and human nature is human nature and human psychology. It doesn't matter. But as soon as that market goes against you, you're going to be inclined to get out to preserve your capital. Unfortunately, the way we make money is we put capital in harm's way. Conversely, as soon as you make a little bit of money, you're going to be tempted to take that money off the table so you could pay for your groceries or your rent or whatever. So adequately capitalized, being adequately capitalized is a big problem that I see quite often. Now, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. My products aren't exactly cheap, but I think they're worth every penny because I truly believe if you do what I say, for instance, in the stock course, the stock selection course, then I think you should be able to learn how to pick the best stocks. And if you're picking the best stocks, you're going to be avoiding losers or more losers, I should say, and you're going to have more winners. So everything I do, I fully believe it pays for itself. Now, some people are like, well, how long will it take to pay for itself? It's like, I don't know. But I think in the long run, it'll more than pay for itself. Now, if you have no money, no problem. Start learning for free. Come to these webinars every week. It's going to take you a little bit longer, but that's okay. Uh, read. I've got 500 and something posts, blog posts. Read those blog posts. Today's webinar will probably become a blog post tomorrow. But if you don't have a lot of money to trade, instead of putting that money in the market and creating, number one, some psychological problems for yourself, and number two, and more importantly, losing your money for those aforementioned reasons, then I would encourage you to get educated and spend that money on education. And it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper in the long run. That I can promise you. I've seen people lose thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in the market, and then like, well, maybe, maybe I will uh, get some education here. I've seen one guy email me for like 10 years, and he's asking me all these questions and all these things, and I'm like, geez, this guy is, uh, I think he's mentally challenged. I think he has a problem. How many times am I going to tell him, go back and read the book, at least read the book, reread it. And, you know, oh, I've been, I've been meaning to get that. You've been meaning to get it for 10 years? It's like, why would you go out and try to trade someone's methodology without fully wrapping your head around it and fully understanding it? So if you don't have a lot of money, no problem. Down the road, maybe you will, but you're not going to create that wealth through the markets unless you gamble and get really, really lucky. So, again, if you don't have the money, invest what little money you have into education. Now, just like people email me over and over again, I see this happen quite often. Jesse Livermore once said that people make mistakes and they know that they're making them. And I'm not going to go into too many anecdotes on this, I promise, because I've, I've said it a thousand times. But the bottom line is, whenever I work with someone one-on-one, -on -one, in fact, right now, I'm willing to do that for free, for an hour at least, for anybody who's serious. And I'll show you that on my website in one second, how to access that. And usually within an hour of time, I can identify some problems. And if I can't identify the problems, you know what I do? I ask. And I would say 99% of the time, I get an answer. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trading in mediocre markets. I'm not honoring my stock. I'm, I'm trying to get in early and beat the system. The list goes on and on. And again, as I've said quite a bit, and I promise not too many antidotes, but, and if they don't tell me what's going on, I could look at their records and I could tell them pretty quickly. I could discover pretty quickly what they're doing wrong. You know, why, why do you have this stock that you're down 50% in? What, what's going on there? Oh, yeah, I didn't honor my stop. I, I know that. Why, why did you make these 20 trades in this one particular stock, these intraday trades, these day trades? 
oh, uh, yeah, I know, I shouldn't have been doing that. Okay, so if you don't know what you're doing wrong, and you do, then it doesn't take long to figure out what you're doing wrong. So people will email me years and years and years and years. Uh, ten, I've had people have emailed me 10 years to a point where I've actually cut off a few people. And I know that's a little assy of me, but there's only so much time. And if I'm wasting time on people who are not willing to learn and who are going to take my time up for 10 years, then I'm taking time away from, number one, my paying clients, and number two, people who are serious about learning. So as Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. We've all heard this before. So what is that first step to becoming a successful trader? Well, the first step is on the next trade and only that trade, okay? I'm going to give you five things to do, okay? So if you could do these five things on your next trade, just your next trade, just your next trade, then you could do it. Number one, I will pick the best and leave the rest. Now, this is only on your next trade. If you can't do these five things on your next trade, then I hate to say it, and this is something I never get into because I think anyone could do it. I think anyone could learn how to trade. But if you can't do this on your next trade, provided, of course, you're educated and you understand everything, okay, then maybe you shouldn't be trading, okay? So the first thing you want to do is you want to pick the best and leave the rest. It shocks me that people who look for perfection in their lives work, in their careers, the doctors out there, surgeons and specialists, and the entrepreneurs and the capitalists and all these people that go out there and create money, create wealth through hard work. They look for perfection in that life, but for some reason they accept mediocrity in trading. So pick the best and leave the rest. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if the stock looks like an electrocardiogram, then maybe it's not a stock that you should be trading. Now, don't be nervous. I'm not going to pick on you too much. But there's been times, but quite often, would people come to the, to the show, this show, and I'll point out that the stock they're talking about looks like an electrocardiogram. This is what an electrocardiogram looks like, okay? And I, it's kind of exciting when I speak to a foreign-speaking audience through a translator. I explain to them, if you look at the chart and you can hear beep, beep, beep in the back of your head, did you know it's a market you should be trading? And usually after a day of lecturing, by the end of the day, when we're looking at their particular markets, their local markets, looking for opportunities, I'll bring up a stock going through a, a stock list, and it looks like this, and people in the audience will start beeping back at me. It's kind of exciting. It's kind of like a, now I know what an artist feels like when they say the, uh, the greatest thing is when you're an artist and you sing a song and your audience sings it back to you. So when people start beeping at me, it makes me feel great. So they get it. Okay. So a stock shouldn't look like an electrocardiogram. Now, what's shocking is, again, these same people who look for perfection in life will email me a chart that looks like this. Why do you want to trade a chart that's just all over the place? I don't know. So picking the best and leaving the rest, what does that mean? Well, obviously, I spent 14 hours in a course talking about that and you can get that on my website i'm gonna probably put it on sale here this for this weekend so 
email me if you want to um, head start on that. But a couple of quick things I could tell you. First of all, ideally, now if we're talking about a trend resumption pattern, trend resumption is going to look like this, okay? Emerging trends are going to look like this, a little bit more difficult, okay, with the emerging trends and the trend resumption patterns. Let me redraw that. Trend resumption is going to look like a generic pullback. Emerging trends going to look something like this, okay? Now, starting with the trend resumption pattern, you want to see some trend qualifiers in the direction of the trend. For instance, you want to see gaps, okay? Or you want to see laps, meaning that let's say the market closes here. It opens somewhere up here. It overlaps the price, but there is a, a price gap, so to speak, overnight you want to see wide range bars in the direction of the trend you want to see persistency meaning the stock goes up day after day after day after day after day mathematically that's equivalent to linear regression i like to draw a trend line through as many bars as possible okay you also want to see acceleration. So if you see a market kind of gradually working its way higher, you'd like to see that market begin to accelerate higher. Now, obviously, you won't always get all of these in every chart, but you want to look for as many as possible. You also want to see strong closes. You want to see that market close towards the top of its range. It means that there were buying, there was buying into the close, or at the least there wasn't any selling. Okay. So these are just a few things that you want to look for, and it should all be in the direction of the trend. And the next thing is that the trend, the trend should be obvious. You should be able to draw a big arrow on the charts, okay? So you want all these things. Also, let's say you have a setup that looks like this. You also want to make sure there's not any overhead supply, any trading that's just above where you get in. Let's say you get in here. Well, as soon as it hits this overhead supply, there's a chance, and I use the word chance, but there's a good chance that anybody who bought during this range will be looking to get out of break even. So those are just a few little things I could, I could throw at you quickly to help you in your stock selection. And I think if you just do these things, you're going to find out that your stock picking is going to vastly improve. But for some reason, again, people look for perfection in life, in the real life, and then settle for mediocrity in the markets. Just because you like a company doesn't mean it makes it a good trading vehicle. That's why I look at a couple thousand stocks every night. I'm looking for all of these characteristics and then some, as opposed to just say, well, I'm just going to watch a couple stocks and then hopefully we'll, we'll, We'll give it a shot. Once you do get the pullback, and it could be as simply as like a one-day pullback. Let's look at, let's say you have a persistent pullback, which is just a persistent trend like this. And then you have, let's say you have like a TKO move. Well, you want to make sure that knockout move is big enough to have knocked out some participants. Now, if you're trading like a generic pullback getting back up here, I know we're getting a little busy. You want to make sure this pullback is deep enough based on the volatility of the stock to have knocked out some players. Just like the trend knockout, the goal of that is to knock out some players. You want to make sure the pullback is deep enough to have knocked out some traders, possibly attracted some shorts, which will help to propel your, your position higher. And also the people who are knocked out, if they rush back in, that will help to propel your position higher. By the way, as I often preach, everything that I do has a basis grounded in psychology and reading the psychology of the participants. Right now we're talking about our own psychology in today's lecture, but this, the when you boil technical analysis down to its utmost level, and I'm not talking about all these crazy and arcane and complex numerology and all that other bullshit. I'm talking about just the basis of technical analysis. It's grounded in reading the emotions of others while keeping your own in check. So your own trading psychology is very important, but you want to read 
the emotions of the others. Understand the psychology of the participants. For instance, overhead supply, what's going on there? Well, you know people have likely bought in that range and might be looking to get out of break even. It's human nature. People, people look to get out of break even. They look to get off the hook. Trend knockout. You know people have likely gotten knocked out of the market. You know that shorts have likely been attracted. Okay. Persistency. That means there's some sort of demand for the market. You know that people are buying the market. Okay. So everything is grounded in technical analysis. So again, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. Okay. Now, for emerging trend patterns, a little bit more difficult, okay? Let's go to a blank screen on that. Emerging trend means a good question. I'll, I'll get to them in just one second. I don't want to get off topic because you know me. I'll go off on a tangent for an hour. <laughs> emerging trend is when you have an old trend that either begins to die out and a new one begins. Okay, that would be on the upside. This would be on the, or that this would be an uptrend becoming a downtrend. This would be a downtrend becoming an uptrend. Okay, so that's an emerging trend. Now, my two favorite patterns are the bow tie moving averages, where you had the three moving averages come together over a short period of time. Kind of looks like a bow tie. And that, tells you that the trend may be coming to an end and a new one may be beginning. Sometimes, as I often preach, it becomes more of a process. I'm sorry, an event than a process. So this is the process top. This is the process bottom. This is a an event top. This is an event bottom. Okay. Now, I get more questions on my emerging trend patterns and all my other patterns combined. So the first thing I would suggest you do is learn how to just trade a generic trend. And the best way to do that for these trend resumption patterns is just to draw a big arrow on your chart. If you can't draw a big arrow on your chart, then it might not be a trend. Emerging trends, again, a little bit more tricky. But once you have trend resumption patterns mastered, then move into the emerging trend patterns. How do you know they will want to get out at support? It's again, it's human nature. There's no guarantees, okay? But if you have a market that looks like this, okay, and then it sells off, chances are people are gonna look to get out at break even. It's human nature. No, there's no guarantee. Okay? You want a guarantee? Buy a toaster. But I'm a man on the streets kind of guy, and I listen to what's going on. Just like recently I said, one of my wife's, wife's friends called me and asked about the stock market thing, wanted to learn more about the stock market thing, because she started investing last year. Guess what? She's already losing money, especially with the high fees that they're charging her. So that tells me right there that at least people who bought stocks in 2015 – are already beginning to question their investment with the overhead supply. As I've told the story a thousand times, neighbor calls me out the blue. Nobody ever calls me before they buy a stock. Everyone calls me after the fact, okay? Calls me up. What do you think about GE? I was like, oh, I don't know. It's trading around 17 now. There's a ton of overhead supply at 20 to 20 something that means a lot of people bought during that range and might be looking to get out at break even and then what does he say next or oh, uh, 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 i bought at 21 you know so he was already long at 21 looking to get out of break even so that just tells me human nature is human nature and he held on to the slide so again pick the best and leave the rest Dave, I'm interested in how you decide between change of trend trades when there are a number of setups. For example, today, there are a number of stocks that have change of trend patterns. Well, you apply a lot of what I just said. That's a good question. But on a micro level, okay? And that's one thing through 
through me teaching publicly, I've learned quite a bit, especially when I'm standing in front of a a huge screen. I'm not saying this to be egotistical. I'm just saying this is the truth. If I'm standing in front of this huge screen projected 20 feet in the air, like back in the good old days when, when people, when you'd have 500 people in a room, you'll see a couple of those photographs on my website. If you get bored, poke around. I think if you hit education button, you'll see one. And when you're looking at a screen that big, it's kind of like, it's just huge. It's big as daylight. And one thing that I noticed to do it such is even in these patterns, let's say you're trading like a bow tie or first horse or something, even in these emerging trend patterns, believe it or not, you're going to see persistency. You're going to see acceleration. Okay. You're going to see closes in the direction of the new trend. You're going to see wide range bars. Okay. You're going to see all of those things I just talked about. Now, what else? Well, again, this is where the overhead supply is hugely important, okay, to pay attention to. Because chances are, if a stock is way down at multi-year lows and beginning to rally off those lows, beginning like the phoenix to rise from the ashes, it's quite possible that it's going to run into a little bit of trouble along the way, Okay. So those are just a few things for picking the best and leaving the rest. Again, I spent 14 hours on this, so it's going to be pretty hard to sum it up in just a few minutes. But I do have a one-hour video uh, that's free. If you go to the uh, page on stock selection, there is a video there, and I'll show you where that is if you want have a second here. Um, if you go to education... Or if you go to store, I'm sorry, I'm going to be easier in store. I'll show you an education. Let's go to store. So if you go to store and you go down to stock selection, and just click here, there's a video in the middle of the page. So what I would encourage you to do is watch this video right here. And it's about an hour or so long. And it's going to it's gonna give you a, a jump start on your stock selection. Okay. Now, so going into the trade, you're going to pick the best and leave the rest. It does take a little bit of experience to do this. So make sure you give yourself some time. Now, number two. On the next trade, and only the next trade, I will plan, should be my trade ahead of time. Initially had it you, but now it's I, okay? So you know, as soon as the market opens, okay? Let's say it's... Wednesday night, we're looking at charts. We're drinking a big cup of coffee like I like to do when I look at the charts. Sitting back, relax. Ooh, I like this chart. I like that chart. I don't like that chart. Looks like an electrocardiogram. I'm seeing a lot of setups in this one sector. Out of all these stocks, let me look at them. Ooh, I think I like this one the best for all those aforementioned reasons. It's pretty easy to plan while things are consistent. Now, as Montier pointed out, when information is changing or uncertain, stress begins to rise, okay? Think about that. When information is changing or uncertain, stress will begin to rise. So as soon as the market opens the next day, that potential position is either to start going up, start going down, or going sideways, okay? So when information is uncertain or changing, stress is going to rise. Therefore, as I often say, and this brings us back to the prior point, you want to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. So right now we're working on the obsess before 
part of that equation. I'm going to talk a little bit about not afterwards in just one second. So you need to make those decisions when the stress of making those decisions is less. If you try to make decisions on the fly, you're going to end up making emotionally charged decisions. Now, the reason I chose those words carefully, emotionally charged decisions, is every decision has emotion, as I've talked about before. Damasio and Shaw have talked about that quite a bit. Without the emotional part of our brain, we can't make decisions. People often say, oh, you got to eliminate your emotions from trading. Well, you can't eliminate your emotions from trading. Just like you can't eliminate your, your emotions from what you're going to have for lunch. My wife wants to go get a Greek salad today. I love Greek salads, okay? But I've been having some stomach issues over the last few days. I had a little bug last week, you know? So I'm debating whether to go get that salad or not. Ooh, that salad's going to taste good, but is it going to settle well? So I have emotions involved with that decision. So every decision you make in life, margin call, every decision you make in life has some emotions. So you can't eliminate emotions, but you can embrace them. And the way you prevent emotionally charged decisions in your trading is to plan that trade ahead of time. Now, before we talk about the planning, I probably need to touch upon why people don't plan. And I've put a lot of thought into this. And my answer is that the moment you make a plan, that plan has to involve what you're going to do when you're wrong. It has to have a stop in mind. It has to have some point in mind where you're going to be wrong in that position and you will get out, no questions asked. If you don't have a plan, then you're not admitting the potential of failure. But if you do have a plan, you are. And a lot of people don't like to admit that they might be wrong. Any married guys in here? <laughs> you know, How much do you love admitting you're wrong and that your wife is right? And trust me, sooner or later she will be. <laughs> but the point is, people don't plan because I think they have to admit that they could be wrong. And on the flip side, too, if you have a profit target in mind, an initial profit target in mind, you're saying that, hey, I'm going to take partial profits here. So that's also you saying, well, I'm going to limit – my potential gains on this position. Now, unfortunately, you have to do that because you don't know if that trend is going to continue for another day, another week, another year. So you have to be willing to take some money off the table, and that's going to help keep the lights on. It's going to help keep you in business, okay? And it's also going to allow you to have a quote-unquote free position. Keep the questions coming. I'm going to get to them in one second. A hold off on stocks for just a little while, if you don't mind. We'll get to those in one second. So you also have to admit that if you are fortunate enough to catch a trend and you did your homework, everything I outlined at number one, and you think you have the best of the best stock, then as part of that plan, not only do you need a stop, S-T-O-P, but you have to have a spot where you'll be willing to take partial profit. So you have to have a stop as part of that plan, and then you have to have an initial profit target. Okay. Now, the way I trade is I look to capture a swing trade, put some money in my pocket, get my stop up to break even, so I have a quote-unquote free position, and I've yet to find a better way of describing it, but you're playing with the market's money. I'm constantly positioning to try to get a free position. Try to get a free position. Okay. That's my goal in every trade, get to a free position and then hang out for hopefully 10, 15, maybe 20 years on that trade and ride that trade for a long, long time. Obviously, that trailing stop is going to take me out sooner, but that's the ultimate goal. So I'm going to have to have a stop in place. I'm going to have to have an initial profit target. And what else do I need? I'm going to have to have an entry, okay, a place where I, where I will get in. Now, even though in my daily trading service, I'll outline that plan. 
with all of these things exactly in a spreadsheet, what happens? Well, I'll give you a case in point. C, E, and X were long, right? Well, the initial profit target was seven. The stock hit seven. The next day, I get an email. Dave, C, E, and X hit seven yesterday. What should I do? Well, what was the initial profit target? The initial profit target on the position was seven. Okay, so what should you do? What should you have done is take a partial profits at the initial profit target. Now, it sounds like I'm picking on the novice here, but I'm not. You'd be surprised how many people who've been with me for quite a while <laughs> will still ask me, what do I do with this? Now, the other thing I see quite often is, Dave, I'm down 50% in this stock you recommended. XYZ. I'm like, XYZ? I don't remember that stock. Are you sure I recommended that? Because, boy, it looks like a stinker. It looks like this, you know? It looks something like that. Oh, yes, you did. About six months ago. Oh, okay. So I go back and look at the charts, and sure enough, this is XYZ. It looks like this. And then it did this. It hit the stop. But where are they? They're still short. I'm sorry. They're still long, and they're down 50%. And they're wondering, what should I do? Well, where was the stop? Okay. Get out of the stop. Now, keep in mind, there's some minor discretion that you occasionally can apply. But that's assuming that you're already successful and you just want to take it to the next level. And if you read the second half of Layman's, it's in there. I often talk about it in these webinars, so go back and look at those. In fact, the video page is getting fairly well organized now if I say so myself. So check that out as far as that's concerned. Now, the other thing that I've seen or I see quite often is the not waiting for an entry. So as part of the plan, you need to wait for an entry. And that means, let's say you got a generic pullback in here. And we have an entry right here. Okay. Well, what do people do? Well, the stock's way down here. Say it opens and it sells off. This is the next day's trading. They'll buy somewhere down here thinking they'll beat the system. And, of course, six months from now, the stock's way down here. I get an email. Hey, Dave, what do I do with XYZ? I'm down 50%. Well, that sure doesn't look like a stock I would recommend. Oh, yes, you did. Sure enough, I go back and look. It's like, yeah, it looked fantastic back here. But what happened? Rallied up a little bit, sold off, and then never did trigger. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that every trade I recommend that turn, that's uh, subsequently a stinker doesn't trigger, but you'd be surprised at how many trades never trigger that turn into it would have turned into horrible trades. So that one thing in and of itself can keep you out of a lot of trouble. By the way, as I often preach, especially when we talk about stock selection, your best defense is a good offense. I talk a lot about using stops and the importance of money management. And money management will cure a multitude of sins. It'll keep you in the game long enough for you to become successful, provided you want to be successful. Okay? So... What's more important than money management is a good offense, being in the best stocks to begin with, okay? And also avoiding as many bad stocks as possible, the flip side of that equation. And one thing to help you avoid bad stocks is waiting for an entry. Time after time after time, time especially in mediocre markets, especially like a choppy market like 2015, where the market actually ended the down for the year, but mostly sideways overall. Waiting for that entry could keep you out of a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, as a corollary, and I guess this kind of goes back to uh, craving action. So maybe I need to change this to uh, craving action too. But 
like I'll, I might show, let's say I show 10 stocks, one nine a land your list, but it's like, okay, this is, these stocks are on my radar. I really don't like any of them, like extremely like them, but I'm just going to keep an eye on them just to see if they set up. And I do want to show you where I'm finding opportunities or possible opportunities, but let's just watch these and I trade them. I'll just say that flat out. And then in the spreadsheet, I'll say no recommendations tonight. Well, I get an email from somebody. Uh, they, they trade all 10 stocks because they're looking for excitement. They're looking for action. Okay. So don't try to beat the system by getting in early unless we have fantastic conditions like 1999. By all means, just get in early and front run setups and do all these other crazy things because it'll pay off. But for the most part, you definitely want to wait for that entry and you don't want to crave excitement. Again, you want to be selective. Number four, I will see the position to its fruition. In other words, I'm not going to micromanage. Okay. Here's one of our recent setups. We had a buy at this level here. We had to take partial profits at this level here. It's corrected a little bit. What do we do? Nothing. We just trail that stop higher. But Dave, what if it goes sideways for six months? Who cares? Who cares? We already have a profit in it. We'll get stopped out at a profit. Who cares? But in that dead money? No. No, it's it's resting money. Okay. It's not dead yet money. Not dead yet. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to wait with the position. Sometimes a position might just consolidate before it makes its next move. In fact, I would rather get in a position, have it go up, hit the profit target, do this for a little while, go up, do this for a little while, kind of a, a Darvis box style trade because that's a lot more sustainable than this, okay? It's fun when you get into a position and you're up 100% in a few days. Don't get me wrong. I love it. It's great, okay? Woohoo! Unfortunately, that type of move is not sustainable. I would much rather get into a gradual uptrend that consolidates for a while, shakes a few people out, bores people to death, and then takes off again. If I could ever figure out a way to just find these Darvis, these so-called Darvis stocks that would just keep doing this box at the box at the box, I think I could own the world. Okay. In the meantime, I've got a pretty good methodology, which gets me into these Darvis stocks ahead of time. So I'll stick with that for now. Darvis is, uh, he wrote a book, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. It was one of my first books on technical analysis that I read. And I think I got the idea after reading O'Neill's book. And I ended up throwing away all the fundamental stuff O'Neill talked about, but I kept the technical stuff. And that's kind of what got me into technical analysis. And then I also threw away his money management too. But um, I do have to give O'Neill a lot of credit for, sort of getting me towards uh, getting me into technical analysis and teaching me how to think about the markets. But Darvis, which I think was uh, originally recommended in O'Neill's book, the book is a uh, Darvis book is how I made $2 million in the stock market. I need to put the list of books to read back up on my website that kind of got wiped out when I did the uh, new improved upgrade, but definitely read that book. It's a little hard to implement but I think that if you're paying attention to trend and pullbacks and all these things that I like, especially with the money management on top of it, it can help to get you into these Darvis style stocks ahead of time. So you're going to see the position to its fruition. How many of you watch every tick? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. I'm guilty too. I'm watching the market right now while I'm giving this lecture. Okay. We're all guilty. But what's amazing is sometimes when you're not watching every tick, is when you have your biggest winners. And the story I often tell is years ago, I had a pretty sizable position, probably too big given the size of my account. But I went off to sail sailboats in the West, Wind, West Indies, okay? And as soon as I got back, I checked the, uh, grabbed an IBD in the airport. And I was all excited. I made a ton of money while I was away. Now I know if I'd have been sitting in front of a screen, I would have cashed in a long time ago, but I made a tremendous amount of money. So what did I do when I get back to the office? When I got back to the office, 
I immediately cashed out everything, felt like a genius, just paid for my vacation and then some. I think some people actually owed me some money based on the vacation, <laughs> loaned them some money. I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm Mr. Big Shot, you know. Well, what happened to those positions? They kept on going. And I'd have made a lot more money if I'd have just stayed on vacation. You know, it's like a while back. Uh, and just for kind of SGs, I will fire off an occasional day trade in Forex. That's not the bread and butter. That's just something to do. It's something that I kind of enjoy doing. Uh, Forex is a more efficient market. I'd much rather just trade stocks. But I, I will kind of dabble in some of these other more efficient markets on occasion. But I remember... Traders Expo Las Vegas, I had a little position on, and I literally forgot about it, but I had a trailing stop. And then I stayed in an intraday position for like a week, something that was just intended to be a day trade. So I would encourage you not to watch every little tick and instead follow your plan, okay? And watching every tick does not help a stock or any other market move in the intended direction, okay? So all these things are just on your next trade, okay? Just on your next trade. I want you to do these things. And if you can't do these things, again, then you need to either A, rethink your wanting to become a trader, or B, keep working at it until you can do this on your next trade. Okay, so again, by letting things unfold, what does that mean? Is that hard? No, no, turn your screen off if you have to. But if you have a stop in place and the market's a ways away from it, somebody's asking about the scratch, and that's a little bit uh, more detailed conversation. But it's, if the market's way up here and your stop is down here, then there's nothing to do. Just let it go. It's the frozen trade. Let it go. Let it go, okay? Let it go. And let the stop get hit if the market comes down and takes you out. And let the stock continue to run if it doesn't. In other words, make, decision, make the decision a passive one and not an active one. And the way you do that is you let the market actually hit the stop now number five just on your next trade and only your next trade I want you to do a post-mortem I want you to go in and back the chart out and without the benefit of hindsight I want you to look at that chart carefully and I want you to ask I want you to ask yourself did it have these trend qualifiers we just talked about was there overhead supply? Was the trend accelerating or was it an obvious emerging trend? Was there persistency? Was there wide range bars? Was this the best setup that I could have found? Were there any other setups in the same sector that looked even better? Do this postmortem and really look at it. Sometimes it hasn't happened lately. Thank God, because I finally decided, you know, I, obviously I'm getting better at this. But there's been times when I go back and look at trades and go, what the hell was I thinking? But the further you get down the line, provided you're constantly working to get better, this is deliberate practice, okay? People who are good at what they do, not only practice, but there's a deliberate practice which makes you better and better and better. It's a focused type of practice. Every night when I look at charts, my goal is to not just do my analysis, but to get better at doing my analysis. And if I see a big move, question myself, could I have gotten in this move ahead of time? Is there one of my patterns that would have gotten me in? And keep in mind, you won't have a pattern for everything. Sometimes markets just take off and there's no pattern that would have gotten you in. And that's okay. So go back and do your post-mortem. Now, here's the clincher here. Trading is a process type of venture. 
It's process oriented. It's not in results or outcome oriented. Obviously, eventually you want to have some positive outcome and positive results. But the only way you're going to get that is to follow the process. So you need to be very honest with yourself, brutally honest, and say, number one, was this the best position I could have taken to begin with? Was the market conditions really that good going in? Was the market choppy? Was the market trending? Is the market going up? Is the market going down? And then here's where you have to congratulate yourself. If you follow the process by picking the best stock or market to begin with, and by honoring your stop or trailing your stop or taking the partial profits or doing whatever you were supposed to do, then congratulate yourself. Don't look at the outcome and say, wow, I made money on this. I'm smart. Well, that's good, but if and only if you followed the process. As I preach, and here we go yet again. You must understand the importance of process versus outcome. This is the bad teacher thing, I guess, part four or part quattro, whatever language I'm writing in there. So the market sometimes will teach you to gamble. The market will sometimes tell you to get out and you'll end up getting out and the market just sells off hard right after you get out and along. Make you feel smart and make you feel like you did the right thing. But longer term, the correct process is what you should be doing and not worry so much about the out outcome. Now, this goes against human nature. We're not made to trade. We're all goal-oriented. We're all in result-oriented, okay? We all kind of feel like, to some extent, the means justify the ends. But in trading, that's not true because if you're not honoring your stop and that position comes back and you make a lot of money, sooner or later it won't and you lose a lot of money. If you're taking small profits and the market keeps showing you that those profits would have evaporated, that's going to work very well over the short term. But longer term, by not following the process of staying with the position, you're never going to catch any big winners. We had a stock retrace back up a few days ago that we're long. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, short, okay? So whatever this happens, in this case, we were short a stock, okay, did this, and it sold off nicely. It didn't go straight down, obviously, but it, it took a little while, but it went down. We, had, we took some profits off the table, and then what happens? It had a sharp retracement and stopped us out. So... We made money on, on this part, and we made a little money on this part, but guess what? We gave up this much money, okay? So what? But people get upset at following the process when they give up open profits. Well, we don't know if this market's going to stop short of our stop and then take off again, and we'll make many times this amount. But we have that trailing stop in place just in case. And if we get stopped out at a profit, that's a good thing. So what? We didn't make top dollar. Maybe next time we will. But that's the way to play. It's a process. We got to follow the process. When people get upset because they gave up open profits, I even said this in my service last night. What you need to do is go ahead and cash the money out. Just, just make it cash money and take those profits and send them to Cintiv Trading LLC, CO Dave Landry, P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. Send me those profits, preferably in cash, and I want you to go center yourself. Go, go meditate, go center yourself, and I want you to completely forget about the stress of making that money on that trade, okay? So you no longer have to think about that. Relax, free your mind, okay? In 20-something years, I have yet to get any money in my mailbox. So don't beat yourself up if you gave up some profits, provided, of course, you're following the process, okay? 
Now, I want you to do this on the next trade, or just the next trade. And if you could do that, then maybe you, be, you could become successful. So once you do that on the next trade, once you take that first step on the next thousand trades, I want you to do the same exact thing. Okay. All right. Great. Correct. Let's get to these questions. Uh, if you do want to follow along the service again for free, you can get on my delayed service and you can go to this link here. I don't have a, a direct link on my website at this particular point in time. So you'll need this link here to get there and then you could uh it's about a week sometimes 10 days or longer delay depending on how current stuff is but this way you get to see the service and somebody's asked me about last year you could you could look at all the last year's recommendations good bad and indifferent and see how things worked out and you could go i have 10 years available there's a gap in there in between because there's some huge files that i haven't resolved the issue with but um, i'm working to get those uploaded but you could go back and look at the last 10 years. And if some are missing, just let me know. I'll get them to you. But the beauty is you could see, like a lot of stocks I talk about, like the one I just talked about a few minutes ago. You could see it in this delayed service. So you know I'm not just pulling this out the air. Okay. Do you ever use discretion in your sell stops? Yes. That's a little bit more advanced lesson, but that's something that we often talk about in these shows. And just in a nutshell, let's say you have a stock that looks like this, that you're long, and your stop is right here. Oops. Yeah, that's good. So this is really close. So the next day, you know that there's a chance, a very good chance, that this stock will open below that stop. Okay? So what you do is... Now, this is provided you're already successful. If you're not successful, then you just take your lumps and move on until you are successful and disciplined. But what you could do is you know coming into this day that you're, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to get stopped out. So you could pull a stop on the open, let the stock open, and if it reverses and starts to rally, then you can put the stop back in maybe below that intraday low, Okay. See the second half of Layman for more on that. I talk about that. And then also go to my videos page on the website. I talk about that quite often. Okay. 50% left for divorce. <laughs> so if you're so happy, do that. Okay. I am very wary of anyone who says something should happen rather than read the price action. Led me to a better Einstein quote. A man should look for what is and not for what he thinks should be. Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you another one, Phil. This is mine. Believe in what you see and not in what you believe. That's one of mine. Which there's nothing new under the sun. Looks like Einstein must have said it first. <laughs> I watched the stock selection course again last weekend. It's amazing how it seems so, quote, basic, unquote, the first time I watched it long ago. But now after looking at lots and lots of charts and rewatching the course several times, I see the genius of the methods. Great course. Thank you, Matt. Uh, would you mind if I use that as a testimonial? And uh, if you send me a picture of yourself, that would be even better because uh, people – tend to believe a testimonial if there's an actual picture. So that'd be awesome. Wouldn't greed take over? I'm not sure what you mean by that, uh, James. That was in, in the context of overhead supply. Dave, can you post that link in the chat? Uh, Don, I forgot what link that is. Uh, to Darvis's book or? Well, I'm not sure what you mean, wouldn't greed take over. Um, at overhead supply, a lot of people, I think psychologists have actually written about this, and I don't know if it's Montier or whatever, but the, um, the, the need to avoid pain is much greater than the need to seek pleasure. And there's been a lot of psychological experiments done on that. So um, everything I do is empirical, meaning that I just look at the charts. 
But as I learn more and more about psychology, I learn that there's a basis for what I'm seeing. And in reading a lot of these behavioral finance books, I've learned these things. So the need to avoid pain is a much bigger motivator than greed. So if somebody is in this market and it's dropping like a stone, they're feeling the pain and they're looking to get out at break even. So to answer your question, I think the need to avoid pain is a bigger motivator than greed. Okay, so it trumps it. Okay, you're welcome. Oh, you want the, the link for the delayed service? Um, okay. We could just go back a couple. I don't think the, you, you can't link to the links in the, uh, in the chat, can you? Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Let's see if I can find it. Right here. It's just... The word after my website, daylander.com, trading service, foresight, and hindsight. I guess that's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way for me to post links in here. If you guys know how to do that, let me know. Thank you, man. I appreciate that so much. That's awesome. Dave, what do you do when your portfolio is already 100K, already full 100K has been spoken for? Do you continue to put on additional positions? Do you just hold the positions until they are closed. That's uh, from John. Well, here's the deal, John. If let's say you got a hundred K account and you start putting on positions and you end up with a bunch of positions and you're running out of margin. Well, if that's happening, two things are happening. Likely. Number one is that you're in pretty damn good conditions. So some of those positions are going to start hitting the initial profit target. So every time, if you think about it, every time two positions hit the initial profit target, because we're taking half profits, you free up a slot for another position. Also, your portfolio is now growing. So the initial margin that was put up is much less than it was because your account is getting bigger. So that's going to create room. Okay. So if things are going well, then what's going to happen is you're taking profits along the way and you're freeing up slots. And let's say you're already you're, you 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 already have several energy stocks in your portfolio. Like right now, energy is metals and mining looking pretty good. So you already got a few of those in your portfolio. There's no need to put any more on. Okay. Now here's the next thing. And again, provided you are successful, this is lesson 201 or whatever lesson two. If you are successful at what you're doing and you have a bunch of winners in your portfolio. And another stock comes along, it looks fantastic, but you're out of money, then it's okay to go into margin and put on that new position, knowing that some of your existing positions will likely hit the profit target. So some of, let's say you've got a couple of existing positions that are pretty close to the profit target, and you're actually looking to take profits on them. But at the same time, you have a new position you want to put on that you think looks fantastic. Well, and again, this is provided you're already successful. I would caution you against using margin if you're not successful. But if you are successful, it's okay to use margin, but only for that transitional period. Okay, so you could put on that new position while you're scaling out of old positions and then coming off margin. As you scale out your old positions, you come off of margin. So in small doses, provide you're really successful, it's okay to go into margin a little bit, okay? You can post the links here in chat list. All right, let's try that. Is there a chat list? I don't even know where that is. Oh, here we go. There's a chat. All right. Uh, let's see. DaveLandry.com slash T-R-A-D-I-N-G-S-E-R-V-I-C-E. F O R E S I G H T N H I N D S I G H T. Okay. All right, I just put that out to you guys. You're welcome. You're welcome, John. Uh, Phil, I don't know that. I want to say close to 10. Phil wants to know what's the most amount of uh, positions if I had to service. I want to say close to 10. And it's been a while uh, since that's happened because it's, it's usually an ebb and flow. We start putting positions on. 
we either get stopped out, take partial profits, or eventually stopped out at a, a, a at a profit, at a trailing stop profit. But I'd say probably 10 would probably be the maximum. Okay. All right, let's hop onto the charts. Uh, you guys want to start talking about uh, individual stocks. That's fine. And then in the meantime, let me just um, let me just cover the market markets real quick. Um, as you probably know, I did um, the website's being revamped. So uh, if there's anything that's missing, please let me know. Uh, I am open for suggestions, although I do kind of like the way it's turned out in here. And the more I look at it, the more I like it. But obviously, it's not for me to like; it's for you to like. But I'm getting a few questions on where's the commentary. Scroll down to the bottom, and here's the latest content. Here's the podcast. Here's last week's The Week in Charts. And here's my latest blog post. I hate the word blog, but I like to call them a column. And you could also get everything right up here in blog, okay? And the videos will post either down at the bottom, or they'll be, and they'll also be on the video page uh, eventually so this recording if you want to listen to it again or if you want to share it with someone will be uh, posted after this uh, be uploaded as soon as I get done with today's uh, lecture all right let's take a look at the overall market let's take a look at a few things and then keep those stock pick comments we'll take a look at them um, this is the tricky part okay the easy part is when it looks like a market is selling off, like it did recently, and it did. You get short, you ride the shorts down. It's kind of fun, okay? It's really nice to keep your head while everyone's losing theirs by following the system. Doesn't always work out so beautifully, but sometimes it does. The hard part is when you get these retrace rallies, and it's typical. It comes with the territory. I often say, love the trend you're in. I would much rather trade a long trend upside, a bear market, a bull market, I'm sorry, than a bear market, but you got to love the trend you're in. Right now, the S&P 500, pretty darn persistent uptrend. What, what we just talked about, persistency. Well, it's been pretty damn persistent on upside, okay? I just don't trust it. We're kind of stalling out a little bit at overbought conditions. People's like, Dave, how do you how do you gauge overbought? Well, you just kind of you can eyeball it, and it's like you can kind of measure it too. Market's going up over uh, nearly ten percent in a couple of weeks. That's pretty much overbought. I mean, what did it do in two thousand and fifteen? The entire year of two thousand and fifteen, the market did what? In a whole year, it lost three quarters of a percent in a whole year. So in just a couple, in two weeks, it went up 10%, and it went a whole year, just made no progress, okay? So that's overbought, folks. I hate people when they say that, folks. But that's overbought, and I just eyeball it. There are complex measurements out there, and I've seen, I see quite a few of them. I'm a member of some forums out there, professional forums, and they talk a lot, a lot about these indicators and breadth indicators and all these other great things, which is cool, but I just like to eyeball it. So the S&P 500 still overbought. Um, for those keeping score, we do still have a weekly bow tie in effect, which triggered last summer. And this is when somebody said, oh, have you thought about another line of work? It's like, well, yeah, every day. I mean, every time a position goes against me. But so far on a weekly basis, this sell signal is still in effect until and unless we hit new highs. Now, if the market begins to drop precipitously, if that's a word, my wife will let me know. She listens to the recording. She's pretty good at judging my grammar. If we begin to drop well below this 1800 level, then obviously – the signal has been a successful one and you don't worry so much about it going back to new highs Then you would start looking for a buy signal somewhere at multi-year lows. Okay. 
But until that top gets taken out, then that buy signal on a weekly basis is in effect. And as I said quite a bit, last two times it's happened, we've had a pretty serious slide. Same thing going on in a NASDAQ. So far, NASDAQ just kind of pulling back in here as I've got it drawn in. A little bit of an outside day down so far today. Longer term, just draw your sideways arrow, okay? You go back a year or so. So if you didn't know anything about the market, you say, well, it really hasn't done much in about a year. Yeah, it's going up and down. Yeah. But for the most part, it's just kind of gone sideways in here. And now you have a big fat trading range. Okay. I'm still concerned about the overall market. I still think it's in trouble, but I have to admit it's getting better. Okay. It's been improving over the last few weeks. It's what happens next that's important. I guess the markets, it's always important what happens next. Russell 2000, or as I call it, the Rusty. Pretty serious slide in place. A little bit more obvious than those other indices. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. A little bit clearer on a weekly chart. Let's clean it up a little bit. So far, pretty serious slide in place. So far, just pull it back. So far, it still looks like it's getting ready to make a new leg lower. Okay? Can't guarantee that, but sure looks like that's what it wants to do. Okay? And again, if you didn't know anything, just draw your line. You can go back to 2013. And we're not too far off to 2013 lows, okay? Or at least that year. So if we trade it down at low, you've given up. If we trade it down below, let's say, this 90 level, then you're down here at multi-year lows, and you've given up two years worth of trading. Again, everything I do is a psychological basis. Okay, like my wife's friend, she's beginning to lose money. She wants to know why. Well, the market's going down. That's why it's going sideways. That's why. And if a market's going sideways and you're being charged 5% or 10%, whatever your commissions are, you're going to lose money. As far as the sector action, still a bull on the metals and mining and still a bull on the energies. Uh, they've The energies overall do have some overhead supply to deal with. But so far, they've begun to push into it. Uh, you have a bow tie in the energies overall. And so far, you're just going to pull back a little bit. Metals and mining, ditto for the metals and mining. In fact, metals and mining look a little bit cleaner. As you can see, they've taken out this overhead supply for the most part. And so far, just kind of pull back a little bit. Okay. Uh, a lot of other sectors sort of look like the overall market. Hardware and software comes to mind. And you got to have software for your hardware, right? So if I could find those, there to go. This hardware, kind of like the overall market, has just sort of been pulling back in here. Sort of like the overall market. It looks like it's in trouble. In fact, it looks like it's in more trouble. Yeah, it's a pretty big run. But Dave, isn't that a trend transition? Well, it's not coming off of major, 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 major lows. The market's still at pretty high levels. Just like the S&P 500 might make a bow tie in here, and may, it may already have. I haven't looked at it. Uh, yeah, it's sort of making a bow tie in here. Not quite, but getting there. But it's coming off of high levels. So I'd much rather trade a bow tie that's coming off of... like a 2009 low, okay, or a 2002-2003 low, and then same thing off the highs, okay. So this big sell signal we have here off the high, to me, is a lot more important than a minor buy signal that we have right here. So I would continue to be careful. It doesn't mean that we're not going to take setups if we see them and we like them. There's a couple of IPOs that look pretty good lately, okay. Keeping an eye on those. Because the one that took off yesterday, I don't want a little pattern. So it was pretty nice. So we're just not going to throw caution to the wind and buy with both fists. Okay, Terry says, Dave, it, it looked reasonable that, reasonable that the market may be currently pausing, similar to last October before the run up towards the semi high, then another big leg down. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I mean, the market could do whatever it wants. Um, 
I'm getting a lot of questions. Uh, was 2015 just a consolidation or just a distribution? Maybe. I don't know. Distribution says, well, it's just, uh, you know, stocks are changing hands. Well, stocks are always changing hands. So that kind of talk is, it doesn't really do you any good. Um, there are different scenarios I've kind of played out in my head or playing out in my head. The worst thing this market could do would be to to go on to make new highs, to take out these highs decisively, and then at some point die. Which, if it did take out those new highs decisively, at some point it would die. Okay, I don't know the exact timing on that. Uh, like Justice Potter Stewart, I'll know when I see it. That would trap a lot of people in. That would make everybody who bought since 2009 feel smart. And then would just absolutely spit them out. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate that that will happen right now. I'm still kind of in this concerned about the market mode. I'm not going to say I'm a bear because I don't want to label myself, especially when we're finding some stocks that are worth buying. So far, they've been mostly in the energies, but I am seeing some beaten up stocks in some other areas that could be bottoming out and could see set up soon. All right, let's um, take a look at some of these stocks you guys are asking about. EDIT. Uh, first thing jumps out at me in this one, and this is a uh, IPO. As I said a minute ago, some of these IPOs are taking off in here. Um, to those with a good eye, that's what buy a B strategy. My only problem with something like this is it ran up about 250% of a short period of time. So it is a bit of a dangerous stock to trade. And yes, I have been watching this one. Yes, it has been on my radar. Uh, yeah, it's set up, but boy, I tell you, it's going to be a crazy, crazy ride. I mean, you might have an entry, let's say, at 35, and you could have a stop way down here somewhere if you decided to take that one. So that one's almost too crazy by my standards, and I get criticized a lot for these crazy stocks that I like to trade. STMP on a weekly chart is a great Darvis example. All right, thank you. Let's take a look at that, STMP. Uh... Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I hear you on a weekly basis. Darvis, it says it makes a box, and then it makes another box, and then it makes another box. Yeah, it's a little bumpy. It's a little bumpy ride, but I hear you. Looks like every. It looks like it's uh, earnings, earnings, earnings. Then it makes earnings, gets excited, gets ahead of itself, earnings. I bet that's every three months. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, if you long, stay long. Howard says, it seems seem like they have stalled just under 200 SMA, but they have recaptured the 50. The 50 will start to slope up soon, which SB bullish? Question mark? I don't know. Somebody emailed me the other day. Are you bullish now? Because the moving average has turned up. I'm like, no, not yet. The market would, again, read my lips. The market would actually have to make new highs. Uh, where is my... Thing. So let's add a, you want to look at a 200 day moving average? All right, that's a 50. Let's add a 50 and let's add a 200. And we'll make the 200 like uh, something kind of uh, pretty. Let's go with a, how's that? That'll work. Okay, um, so we're above the 50, but we're still below the 200. I wouldn't get too excited about this market just yet. Look at the slope of the 200. And then as I often say, obviously the bow tie will help you keep, keep you on the right side of the market, but sometimes just the slope of the 50-week moving average could do a pretty damn good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. And now... As you can see, that slope is decidedly negative. How many times I have to tell you? Every Thursday at 10 o'clock, I do a show. MUX for Andre. Um, yeah, that one's okay. Uh, that's been on my uh, Landry list for a while, I think, as you know. It needs a little bit more pullback, though, because it's had a pretty good run. That's a 100% run, so a little bit more knockout move for my buddy Andre. I got to meet Andre in New York. It was nice to meet you, buddy. Cosi, Cosi, uh, which means so-so, uh, I think, in Italian. 
Uh, so this is the so-so restaurant. Um, this overhead supply is behind this one, so this would be more relevant. So um, it's shaped up. It's kind of thin. It's a penny stock, so uh, maybe on a pullback, a little bit more pullback, but it is a penny stock, so be careful with that. TSO is going to be oil field related. And um, no, I think you could do better in the uh, oil field stocks. Also, this is refining, refinery. Keep in mind that a refinery, um, a refiner is not going to do as well with, 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 with rising oil prices as it will with low oil prices. Does that make sense? What was the Fidel Castro answering the more? Was that Fidel Castro answering the margin call? HMY. If you've called my office lately and left me a message, please let me know because I just pretty much, with all the political calls and solicitors and everything, I've just, I just pretty much given up on answering the phone. So just say, hey, Dave, I'm calling you now. Shoot me an email. Are you there? And I'll be happy to answer my phone. But boy, I tell you, both lines have been slammed lately. Uh, yeah, this is okay, but you need a pullback, obviously. But yeah, it's in a nice trend. Uh, Robert, good uh, good eye on that one. I've seen others do it. It's on your end. I've seen others do it. It's on your end. What have you seen others do? I guess it's out of context. Uh, this one looks okay. It's kind of bottomed out in here. Uh, a little bit on a thin side. I think you could probably find some other ones in the oil and gas, but I'll, I'll definitely give it an okay. Um, it hadn't made this huge thrust from lows. Let's check the bow tie. Hasn't bow tied yet. I think you could find something better in oil and gas, but it's not bad, James. Um, so I would keep that on the list maybe. X is going to be a steel stock, the biggest of them all. Yeah, it looks good. It's had a pretty serious run from lows, but, yeah, I think this looks pretty good. Ideally, I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. But sometimes with these trend transitional patterns, you don't get it. So, yeah, maybe around 14, if you take out 14, and then you'd have to give it a really wide berth, okay? Look at the HV, 100, huge HV. My only other problem, though, is you've got a lot of overhead supply in the 20 range. So I guess that'd be a good problem to have, but I prefer something that would have less overhead supply. But it's certainly uh, pretty good. Mr. Reese wants to know about S FCM, FSM? Uh, it's okay. First thing jumps out. A lot of overhead supply here. It's a silver stock, so they can be a little crazy. That was a while back. Um, it looks okay. It You did have the bow tie here. The trigger would have been here. Uh, at this point, maybe a deeper pullback. I think I'd wait for a pullback. Karen wants to know about ECA. Glad you're back in, Karen. Karen got knocked off. Um yeah, ECA looks pretty good, but a lot of overhead supply just above the market. Uh, there's some other stocks and energies. You could almost throw a dart at the energies right now, and they're all pretty much set up. I told my clients last night, look, I had 70-something stocks coming in to, tonight to the Landry list. Um, if you think an uh, energy stock is set up, it probably is. Here are my favorites, and I put them in the list. Hymex? Yeah, we just talked about that one, huh? Max. Yeah, we just talked about that one, I think. If not, wait for – no, we didn't. Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. I think I would leave this one alone. Uh, it looks okay uh, with these – it's sort of a transitional pattern. I think I'd rather have a stock coming off of major lows. I remember we traded this one years ago back way back here somewhere where it was coming off of major lows uh, as opposed to being kind of wide and loose. FCX, that's going to be Freeport back moron. Um, uh, metals and mining, same as energies, lots and lots of setups. A little bit of overhead supply to contend with, but certainly a good-looking setup, certainly a bow tie, certainly pull back a little bit. I would give that a yes with the caveat that you could hit a little uh, overhead supply. But with commodities, sometimes you got to be a little bit more um, – what word am I looking for? Lenient. Twitter, T-W-T-R, says for short, stairs tipping down. Well, my only problem with Twitter as a short is you're all the way down here already. And and that's okay. Don't get me wrong. as a trend follower. But with the market 
still at these high levels. Take a look at like the spiders. The market's way up here still, okay? So I would find stocks that had a long ways to fall as opposed to the ones that are already there. Can't shoot darts. Can't shoot darts? CHK? Ken, you're next. Oh, we already did that. Cozy, cozy, cozy. Yeah, CHK looks pretty good. My only problem with CHK is it was initially in my landry list, but I think it took it out. You have a mountain of overhead supply. I guess that'd be a good problem to have because it's not that far above the market. But I think I would pass based on that. All right, Phil wants to know about Jack. Uh, no. It's, it's well, it's at fairly low levels. It's not set up. Um, let me interview myself. Is it in a downtrend? Yes. Is it set up? No. Maybe let it take out 60 and the next pullback might be worth a shot. I hear you, though. You, you see it as kind of a base breakdown. I think if you flip the chart over, it would look pretty good as a long. So, yeah, I hear you. Kind of a base breakdown, throw back to the base, but you'd already be short at this juncture, so it would have to take out the old lows. But, yeah, if you're short, good job. It's a little bit unorthodox as a setup, though. NUE for Miss Susan. Susan, how you doing, babe? Um, a lot of overhead supply. I just said babe. I hope that's not sexually harassing you. <laughs> Uh, I think I'd pass based on the overhead supply. TGRP? TGRP? TRGP. TRGP. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, yeah, I can't really fault you too much on that. I can't fault you at all. Nice little bow tie, nice little pullback at the bow tie. Uh, watch this HV, though. Crazy, crazy HV on that one. Natural gas could be all over the place, so be careful. GSV? Yeah, I mean, this is one that did catch my eye. It needs a little bit more of a pullback. It's also had a pretty incredible run from lows, so be careful with that. GPL? That's going to be a Great Panther or something. One of those little silver stocks. Uh, okay, volume, but then when you look at the factor in price, yeah, it's kind of a penny stock. But on a pullback, maybe, but it's a penny stock. Too dangerous. ORBC. This one has defined gravity. ORBC. That's uh, if I'm thinking the right stock. ORBC. Why won't it work? Yeah, uh, Maybe on a pullback, but that one certainly has defined gravity. I haven't been keeping up my momentum list lately just because it's so much work. Um, but I remember a few days ago thinking, boy, if I was, that would certainly be on my momentum list, my main momentum list. Rick, that's going to be another metal. Um, maybe on a pullback. Yeah, wait for a pullback. That looks... It's it's worked its way higher. It's it's definitely that there's your Darvis box. It's working its way higher in a Darvis style. JLNG. Uh no. No, there's some other shippers out there that look better. Uh look at tonight's landry list or today's landry list for some some ideas there. I'm not a huge fan of shipping stocks because they can be choppy, but every now and then it's the Steve Winwood trade. You see it you see a setup, you have to take it. DRD. Um, it's going to need another pullback. Okay. Take a look at today's Landry list. There's a gold in there. It looks pretty good. ADPT. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's a hospital. Kind of hard to get excited about a hospital, but I hear you. Um, ideally, I prefer it if it was like all the way at brand new lows, but I hear you. Um, it's not bad. You've got a pretty serious base in here. You've got a bow tie. I like the way it undercut this base right here. That kind of fools some people. So, yeah, I'll give you not bad on that. It's not bad. Yeah, it's got a pretty high HV. Glog. Want to pull back? Well, yeah, you push it into some 
overhead supply. But that's a good example of a shipping stock that looks a little bit better than uh, that last one we looked at. James, that's on the Landry list. You're on the service. You know that. Can't talk about it. DRD, we talked about GSS. This could be another gold stock. Yeah, on a pullback. But it's also a very cheap, cheap, cheap stock. So uh, be super careful with that. It's a penny stock. Oh, no, no, no worries. Um, not a problem. And if it's on a Landry list, I like it to begin with. You know, people always email, you like this one? Well, it's on my Landry list, yeah. <laughs> Do you like it better than one you have recommended? No, I wouldn't have recommended the one, but it might be more volatile or choppy or something. Um, more, might be more volatile. Uh, speaking of, ch I'm saying choppy, because this stock looks a little choppy here. It's recently broken out, but uh, it just, it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, I hear you shorter term, it's breaking out, but. I don't know. I'm having a hard time getting excited about that. I think the energies and metals and mining for now are probably the place to focus on. Anyway, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time and busy schedule to be here. Good crowd today. Good questions. So, thanks for being here. Thanks for participating. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, Dave at DaveLandry.com. And if it's a quick answer, I will uh, shoot you right back with an answer. And if it's a longer answer or an answer requiring thought, I will use it as fodder for next week's show. If we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and uh, hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.